welcome to the March 2023 edition of City Connection. City Connection is the live television program from the Community Media Center with your Grand Rapids representatives, offering the community the opportunity to hear about efforts from the City Hall and beyond. With the Community Media Center, I'm Starla McDermott, your host. Today on City Connection, we will be joined by the newly elected Second Ward Commissioner Lisa Knight. Commissioner Knight will talk about her role with the city and how she came to run for commissioner. In the second half of the show, we provide time for you for questions and comments. To take part in the conversation, you can send your questions or comments to cityconnection at grcmc.org, through Twitter at GRTV Access, or by commenting at the GRTV Facebook page. City Connection, a collaboration between the Community Media Center and the City of Grand Rapids, is broadcasting live today, March 6th, 2023, here on Community Access Television Channel 24, and live streaming at therapidian.org and GRTV's Facebook page. We will be rebroadcasting this program throughout the month on cable GRTV's Channel 25. And now in the studio with me tonight is Commissioner Lisa Knight. Commissioner Knight, Hello. thank you for coming so much. Absolutely. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. This is exciting. Yes. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit, share a little bit about yourself before we dive into your new elected position as city commissioner. Kind of tell us what you've been doing up until this point. Oh, man, living life. Um, <laughs> uh, I was born and raised uh, here in uh, Grand Rapids. Um, you know, just uh, coming from a family of hard workers um, and advocates, people that worked in community, being a voice for others, uh, watching my my dad and the, a lot of the things that he did. Uh, he was the president of the NAACP okay. um, for a while and my aunts were all engaged and he would be at the churches and in the community trying to get people to get engaged with the NAACP. But also knowing the struggles that uh, he went through uh, throughout his journey in his life, coming from down south and the family having to move up to Grand Rapids um, because of racial turmoil uh, that was going on down there, and then you know having to do some of the same stuff up here in the James Crow North. <laughs> um, and so I went to uh, East Kentwood for a while, got a, a great group of uh, people out there that we went to school with and we're still connected with, you know, today and then moved into the city after my parents had uh, separated and I uh, was living with my dad and so went to Creston High School and graduated from there. Um, and then having been in different parts of the city for different reasons, you know, my life and growing up and um, beginning to have a family and all of those things. So I ended up on the north, northeast end of town. Um, and I've always, um, I've always kind of been that, that fighter, right? Trying to protect other people, trying to make sure that people have the things they need and also going through uh, times in my life where I didn't have the right. things that I needed, right? And having to navigate through those spaces and try to figure out who I was and, and what was out there for me and to take care of my children, right? To raise a family, that's, that's huge. It is. Um, and it's hard and it's difficult. And sometimes you don't know how to how to get through uh, the spaces to really see, you know, hope. Like you feel like you're on this hamster wheel trying to trying to make it. And so, I think that part of my life is what transitioned in me working for the Urban League for uh, a while and uh, really being out in the community and advocating for the rights of people in the community who didn't have access to the things that they needed and needed a voice of somebody to stand up for them and, and opportunities provided for them and knowing where to find the things. Um, that, that was something that's always been my heart. Um, you know, always trying to do, I mean, I had to, used to have to back down from trying to protect my sister all the time, you know, in school. And I got five sisters and one brother, but trying to, you know, protect her from people that were trying to, you know, beat her up, you know, and stepping in and, and taking the fight for her. Were you the oldest sister? No, no, she, no? she wasn't even the oldest. <laughs> she was just the one above me. Okay. Um, <laughs> so that was, that was really interesting. Um, but I think that, that piece of me always wanting to fight for what's right for people that just kind of gets under my skin a little bit. And so um, really seeing, uh, being able to escalate that into another realm and to be able to take that voice to another level in, in a different space 
and be able to bring that that real life experience um, to the table right. and to advocate for the things that people need. And so here I am. Okay. So was there some epiphany or one particular thing that happened that made you, I'm, I'm gonna need to run for a commissioner, things aren't happening the way they need to be happening, I need to change something? I think there's a, a, a time in my life where, you know, I, I really believed that that was a space that I was supposed to be in, right? So you, you can be on the ground and you can, you know, get to know people in different organizations and moving in community where you know people, if somebody has a need, you pick up a phone and you call them and you're like, listen, I know this person in this situation, can you help? Or do you know somebody that can help? And talking with other um, leaders in the community, people that are, you know, working at the state now, right, in different political positions that said, Lisa, you really need to think about running for office, right? And I think when it was first presented to me, it was more running for, you know, like state rep, right? Right. And I was like, well, you know, I need to know what's going on here first, right. you know, and yeah. try to impact some things here in the city. And so um, I didn't run for that position, um, but I decided, you know, maybe it is time for me to step up my game. Right. I guess that's the way I saw it. Right. Um, I still doing things in, you know, in community and, and working with connections and people that I networked with. But how can I take that to another level and help people in a deeper way, I guess. And that was my thing. So it wasn't really just this uh, particular uh, time that I decided to run. I decided to run some years ago. Okay. Um, but for uh, work-related reasons, I I backed out of the race, and, and a lot of people didn't know that. Uh, but I did because I I, I didn't want to be in this competition in my workspace. Right. Because I didn't know what that looked like. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and I couldn't afford to lose my job, so right. <laughs> yeah. I, I waited. Right. right. Absolutely. Um, and then you know, watching things that were going on in our community. Um, when the, the riots started happening and when um, Patrick Leoya uh, got shot and killed and uh, the things happening across our nation, it really pushed me to want to be a different voice, right? Uh, people, you know, the government and leadership has always been, and, and we need that. We need leadership and direction around things, but people also need to be connected with those who are in those spaces and know that they can believe and trust in the work that they're doing. And not to say that everybody's unbelievable, but these were feelings that I, not only I had, um, I think they were, they were voices that I heard constantly in community, the same things. And so... Um, I felt like it was an opportunity for me to uh, be a different voice. And so I stepped up and decided to run. Can I ask, was there any fears that you had of jumping into this role or jumping in and putting your feet in and say, I'm gonna run and do this? There's always fears of doing something different and right. putting yourself out there Absolutely. like that, right? It's not it's not an easy thing. I mean, being, being in community, um, so I act and, and I sing as well and have been okay. since I was four years old, right? And so being on that stage, you're always in front of people, right? And you have to begin to take your mind off of that fear and focus on the thing that you're supposed to do. Um, and, and this is a different space, right? Because people see you all the time, right? And, and they want to they wanna connect with you for one reason or another, whether it be good, bad, or indifferent. Right. Um, they want to know who you are. They want to be in your business, you know, <laughs> yeah. as they say. Um, and, and so there, there, yeah, there was a really nervous part, especially towards the end, getting towards the end where the actual election happened, that it was like, oh, my gosh, is this really happening? Right. And what do I do? You know, what, what do I do if I do win? Right. Because I, I, I prepared a concession speech. <laughs> I, I didn't prepare, a, right. you know, a victory speech, right? right? Um, because I just, you know, you hear people saying things and talking all the time, yep. right? And, and so you wonder, well, is, is this really the time? Is this really what you need to be doing? So I did a lot of praying, a lot, right? And, and talking to the people that are in my inner circle, and, and gaining wisdom, and, and it, it's kind of like, it, this, this is not a thing that you really are prepared for, you just, you, you kind of prepare yourself as right. much as you can, but, but there's things that you just don't know, right? Right. And, and, and there's no perfect scenario, 
Um, but I think if your heart is in the right place and you're trying to do the right thing, that you'll figure it out. And, and to keep good people around you that will help you navigate through those spaces and, and, and give you sound wisdom and guidance. And then believing in yourself, right? And I think that was the biggest part for me is just believing that I could. And I always would think about my dad and the things that, that he did. And, and he was a very unassuming uh, 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 man, but, but powerful in the community, right? And he was a minister of visitation. He used to go to all the hospitals and nursing homes and everybody knew him because whether he knew you or not, he was coming in your room. That's great. You know, yeah. and he was going to come pray for you. He was going to come talk to you. you could, we couldn't go into a restaurant and someone pass him and not speak. That's great. You know, yeah. and so, so that, that leadership having to take care of his family and in a time where he was driving truck and his tractor trailer got blown up down south when he was trying to come back home right and, and escaping with his life and knowing that he went through all that and yet would still stand up to people for what is right you know that that's huge for me and that's what's leading you in this as you go forward it's, yeah yeah, it's, it's trying to do what's right, right? There's, again, there's no perfect person in this space and we're not always gonna make uh, decisions that everybody is happy with. But when you go into it with the heart that you're trying to do the best possible work for people, you know, I think um, even when people don't agree with you, they'll still come alongside and say, okay, you know, some people may not, right, right. <laughs> but for the most part, right, I, people I think know they, your heart. And I think that they love that, I mean, you're part of our community. You're not, you're not a long-term politician. You have, yeah. you, you know what's going on and you're there for that. Yeah, so. yeah. And, and that's, that's it. I had this conversation with somebody a couple of weeks ago and I said, listen, I, I live here. Right. Okay. Don't forget that. I, I still live in the community. Now I've shifted and this title is there, but that title doesn't make me any less of what and you've done, that's right. or seen, or that I live in this community. I'm still yes. at the same address, Absolutely. and I still raised my kids here, and I still graduated from here, and I still see the things that go on, and I talk to people in community, and I see the issues on our streets. Absolutely, right? And, and so that, that stuff touches my heart, and I still want to do some good work, what, whatever that looks like. That's wonderful. All right. All right, well, it's time for our very first break. When we come back, we'll be asking Commissioner Knight about the second ward and what it means to represent a city ward. Stay tuned and we'll be right back. For over 30 years after humble beginnings as a public access TV station, the Community Media Center has grown to be an active, multi-platform media and technology assistance organization, encouraging and enabling our community to push the creative boundaries. We power a variety of resources, including a music-centered community radio station, WYCE, a community venue with stage and screen at Wealthy Theater, citizen-driven journalism with the Rapidian, a web development team empowering local nonprofits, an education department that trains and broadens students' minds, and a free speech public access television studio, GRTV, where it all began. By introducing audiences to new voices and ideas, we enhance community engagement and create connections between artists and audiences enriching our city's cultural offerings. We empower and collaborate with platforms and resources accessible to all and used by all. Every free democratic society depends on media, accessible to the community and uncensored by government. The Community Media Center continues this work for the media landscape of today and tomorrow. These platforms and services empower our neighbors to tell their stories and explore the richness of culture that Grand Rapids has to offer. Connect, discover, learn, create, and share the Grand Rapids Community Media Center.
Welcome back to City Connection, and we are with Commissioner Knight. So, Commissioner Knight, would you share a little bit about the second ward and what that area, what the neighborhood neighborhood is, and a little bit of what your responsibility is as our city commissioner in the second ward? Ooh, you just asked me a whole lot. Okay, <laughs> um, so the second ward is north side of Wealthy, right? And going down to Division, Division to Fulton, Fulton to Monroe, Monroe North, down to um, a little bit past Lake Drive, and then it kind of you got these jogs over like by Plymouth and all of that over to the Beltline north to Four Mile. Okay. Right. But okay. then there's, it, it's, it, it, all the maps are weird. All, it is. All, all of them are. <laughs> the lines are. It's like, it's crazy. You get to certain parts of the third ward and they're like, oh no, that's actually a first ward. Right. But it's, it's a huge ward and there's a lot going on and that covers stuff all the way up by Celebration Cinema. Uh, right on on the west side of the belt line okay um, and then but when you're on like Plainfield right you're like oh this is the second ward well but when you get to a certain part of Plainfield close by four mile on the right side it's actually Plainfield Township <laughs> okay so it's 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 a weird area but most most of that on this side of the bridge uh, going north um, and what I love about it uh, I love the parks I love the trails. I love the White Pines Trail that runs um, north, farther north, um, outside of the city lines, but then also through the city um, and riding bikes. So on all of the parks that we have, you know, you have Riverside and you have Richmond and you have uh, East Hills and Cherry, and, the, and there's so many mm -hmm. um, spaces that people can can go and enjoy and be a part of. But then also thinking about um, the business district. Um, that has grown quite a bit. Like I'm, I'm farther north in the Creston uh, area. Okay. But we have a number of neighborhood associations that represent, you know, all of the North End in these different neighborhood areas, um, which are very active and they're out connecting with community and they're creating opportunities for people to engage. But the diversity is different, right? So I, I worked on the southeast side of town for the most part, but touched you know, everywhere across the city. And in my ward, it's it's not as diverse as it is in the third ward, right? Okay. But I, you know, one of the things that I said is even though we represent these wards, like we don't stop doing things because there's a line, right? right? We continue to work with people in the community. We just, you know, refer to the person that's the lead in that space so that, you know, they know what's going on. So if people contact me um, a lot of times and they're not in my board. And so, you know, I'll talk to them, but then I'll reach out to my, my peers and say, hey, I've had this conversation with this person about this. and You might want to talk to them about that. Um, so th there's a lot going on right. uh, in our community, a lot of business, a lot of um, development, especially around housing. Uh, there's a lot of that going on. Um, in the community, and then so that I guess that leads into well, what what do we do, right? right? What does yeah. the commissioner do? And I think I get that question, you know, more than anything, even starting with my family, you know, with my kids, right? This is making them think a little bit more about what happens in this space and what do we do. And I used to say that I felt like a commissioner's job is to be a conduit between the community and the city, and then vice versa, right? the community talks about the, the cares and concerns in their neighborhood, mm -hmm. what bothers them. And that could be anything from raccoons and possums in their trash uh, to the lighting that's being changed or, you know, why is this development going up and we didn't know anything about it and we didn't have any communication with those people. And a lot of it is a lot of miscommunication about the things that happen in our city, right? You got issues with raccoons and possums in your trash there's a number that you can call, call for people right, but to, they don't know that, right, <laughs> but people yeah. don't know right. and you don't know what you don't know. Right. right? Yep. And so somebody's got to help. Absolutely. You know, yep. give people this information. And, and if people knew it was like, oh, you just call this number and they can help you, you know, then I think they would do that. Right. But there's not one person I know in this city that knows every Everything. single no. thing. No. Not. We try to know as much as we can, but it's hard for people, right? And especially older populations or people that may have navigated this part of the city for most of their lives, but not this part of the city. All the services that are available for people. If this is going on, who do I ask the question to? 
right? right? Who do I talk to in the space? And so that's a big part of why we're there to help navigate through some of that. But then also looking at the changes that go on in a community, when you think about right now what's going on with the master plan mm -hmm. that hasn't been touched since I think 2002. Correct. Um, yep. That's huge. Like that's that's a really big thing. And, and, and I hear people say all the time, I don't like politics. I don't wanna be engaged with politics. Guess what? Politics touches your life right. every single day. And especially the master plan because that's land use. How are we going to use and grow our land and yes. our properties? Yeah. Yes, and so people need to be engaged. So they had some outreach um, opportunities that happened recently. Um, they've got some neighborhood associations that are going to be engaged and people are going to be going door to door and they're going to be doing community listening sessions and all of this stuff. And I just need people to be a part of it. Right. And sometimes it's daunting because you don't know. You don't feel like you belong right. in the space. You don't feel like, you know, you have the voice or the language. But there was a guy named Bo Moses that was told to go and to talk to a, a king in a land and tell him to free hundreds and thousands of people. And he was like, I don't know how to speak to this guy. Right. Right. So somebody was sent to help him say the things he needed to say. Absolutely. Yep. Right. Yeah. And so if we can help people find the resources they need, help them know where to get access to those things, just just communicate with people. I, I think we can do a lot better in our community. There's little things that, you know, if you're in a position for a long time and you think you're doing things the best way. You think it's the best way because it seems to have been working. Well, that's the way it's always been done over and over and over again, right? Right, but but that's also insanity. <laughs> to right. Doing the same thing, expecting a different result, and it doesn't happen. It's not, no. So if, if we begin to look at other ways to engage and and bring people in, and I, and I think they, th this is something that the, the city has been working on, but when you have fresh eyes and, and fresh thoughts, I think it brings a whole nother level of oh, shoot, maybe we can do things this way. Or let's try this, right? Trying to do something that we've never done before in a different way or something that we have done before in a different, different way. way. Well, it sounds like the city is trying to go into neighborhoods and having those conversations. Like with the master plan, they're going in and having these different meetings mm -hmm. and talking to the community and getting their input on these decisions, which I think yeah. is great. Yeah, they are. And, and I think, you know, for me, I, I always say we can always go deeper. You know, there's always more, but you got to understand that that more takes more time. It takes more man work. It takes more, you know what I mean? All of those things, power, manpower right. to do these things. And, and then sometimes you got to try to figure out, well, who can we get to do that, right? Because when you're talking about reaching a whole community, well, who's in those communities that can access the people? Right. So you have neighborhood associations Correct. that are, you know, doing the, the newsletters and doing the community engagement and putting on the events and all of these things that happen in neighborhoods to try to uplift that space and connecting with community and bringing those voices in so that they are a part of what's going on. But that's not everybody. No, it's right. Not, no. You got, you know, people with families that got to take care of their kids. And, oh, I want to you want me to come to this meeting and I have to take the bus and it's going to take me 45 minutes to get there. And, and I haven't fed my kids yep. and I'm hungry, too. And it's like so. So people are, I think, are being more creative in how to engage with people. Um, but it's it's still hard. We're, we're, you're not going to get every single person. You're just not. Right. Everybody's not on social media. Everybody doesn't utilize a, a, a cell phone the same way. Right. Because of access, yep. emails. Cable TV. Cable TV, yep. regular TV, you know, newsletters, mailings, this, that. It, sometimes a lot of the things can be very daunting to a person who has a lot going on in their lives. We all have a different level of bandwidth, um, and we have to figure out the best ways to reach as many people as we can in the things that are going on and engage them and letting them know your voice is important. You were given that voice for a reason. You can shift and change the way things look, but if you're not engaged in it, you can't complain about it right. when you haven't stepped up to give your voice. Probably the wisest advice my mom ever gave me <laughs> was exactly that. Yeah, so. it's, it's a great thing. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we're gonna take a quick break again. And then in our next segment, we will talk a little bit more about um, Commissioner Knight's, um, sorry, Commissioner Knight's time as a city commissioner, but answer some of her questions as well, or your questions. You can email your questions at cityconnection at grcmc.org. 
And if you're watching the stream, you can leave your questions in the comments. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. The Wealthy Theatre is Grand Rapids' local movie theatre and performance centre. Since 1998, it has been a host to nationally touring music groups, local theatre performances, and a variety of community events. Today, the Wealthy Theatre is not only a landmark community treasure with historic significance, but a pioneer in the infusion of technology and traditional theatre. Underneath the elegance and classic sensibility that defines Wealthy Theatre, there is a matrix of new technologies. The theater is completely digital and outfitted with cameras and microphones for concerts, theater and comedy troupes, speakers and lecturers, and so much more. Experience all that Wealthy Theater has to offer. And bring a friend. Be surprised by the Wealthy Theater. WYCE is a world of music. We aim to shine a light on underserved musical artists in a non-commercial format with no advertisements. Volunteers come in to create personalized music programming that broadcasts over the air at 88.1 FM to West Michigan and via the internet to listeners all over the world. These listeners sponsor our efforts, keeping WYCE independent and community owned. Musicians use the station to broaden their audience and build support for their latest projects by submitting their music to be included in our broadcast and performing live in studio. Businesses find their customers through underwriting, nonprofits inform the community to their mission, and listeners stay informed about local events. We believe that music is a powerful force that creates quality relationships in our community, that speaks to our emotions, and provides the soundtrack to our lives. Welcome back to City Connection, and we are with uh, City Commissioner Lisa Knight. Ms. Knight, you ran on transparency in government, and now that you're the commissioner for the second ward, what areas of the city can you bring to light? What areas of the city? Yeah, like what areas of light? Um, I think there's a lot uh, <laughs> across the board, so that's kind of difficult for me to answer. And I, I, I'm only been in a good two months, so I haven't even. I've, I've had four four commission meetings, um, but one of the things I've noticed is again is uh, around housing. Right, that's a huge issue uh, in our community. I just had a young lady yesterday uh, approach me that I didn't know at my church and said, you know, I was talking to somebody else, and she jumped in and she said, "Can you help me with some resources?" Right. And, and housing was it. She's homeless uh, with a three year old. And she said she, you know, called two one one and they recommended her to this agency and they didn't have any housing. So they offered her a tent um, and that about broke my heart. Right. In the winter. In the winter. And so it, it's like, how how are we providing providing the right opportunities for people? And, and, and being real about it, right? So with all this development that's going in, they're all, they're apartments, right? Um, and we have families. We have a lot of families that are unhoused and that need stable housing. And so I, I, I'm having difficulty and I have to you know, make sure that I step back and get all the information that I need, right? But I'm struggling with buildings you know, apartment complexes and we need houses, right? But then we, do we have the land? Right. Do we have the property? 
do we, you know what I mean, to do that? And so I ask questions, right? And we're having this whole thing about the master plan, right? Going back and looking at that. And 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 before, you know, I came on, there was this whole, during the Patrick Leoya um, uh, killing was all about defund the police, right? Um, and so w what does that mean to people? I, I, I hate the word because I think it causes a lot of confusion. Mm -hmm. And so now you've got groups that are talking about reinvest GR. Well, what do they want to reinvest? Well, they're talking about the general fund. Well, where's, why come out of that fund? Why can't it come out of this fund? Or where, where is that money going? Why do you want to take this much from here? And so I'm asking questions. Mm -hmm. I'm asking questions to things that I don't know or didn't know, but then also questions that other people have been asking to exactly. find out, well, where is, where is this money going? And, and why would they want it to come out of this? And, and, and if this is what they're looking for, how does it come out of these different pools of money? And wh what is this fund? What is this fund? So I'm asking those questions because I need to understand too so that I can help communicate that information, right? You had, we had a lot of questions about uh, people about the brownfield. Mm -hmm tax credits, right? right? And people thought that, you know, the, the city was just writing a blank check. Well, th the people that utilize or get approved for these credits have to do the work and they have to put the money out before they're reimbursed for this. However, are we doing this just consistently for, you know, these developments that are just apartments for the people as opposed to more housing, right? right? And then why, why, aren't, why aren't these developments uh, low enough to really meet uh, affordable, right? That term that affordable. we use that just gets thrown around, affordable to you isn't affordable to me. Right. So how do we meet the greatest need in our community and how are we holding people accountable that are coming to the city asking for a credit or asking for whatever it is, making sure that we're asking the right questions, right? And, and I think that's the piece is asking the right questions and challenging the systems that have always been in place that have oppressed people and making sure that we're doing the best possible work. Not just writing blank checks, not just saying yes, not just voting the, the way everybody votes, but being okay to challenge it and stand on, you know, your beliefs, right? Yes. That are impacting people's lives. Absolutely. Okay. Wow. The public comment section of the city meetings seems broken. Recently, it breaks down into people yelling at the commissioners and each other without any nuance, dialogue, or even basic respect. How can we fix this? And this is from Pauline. Um, so Pauline, there's, there's kind of a couple sides to this. And, and I used to wonder to myself, um, when they're talking to you on the day, it's how come you're not talking back? Well, be, because of the rules of right commission, when it's open comment, people are allowed to come and make their comments, but we can't respond. Mm. It, just think about that. If, if we took time to respond, all those people sitting up there to every question that came up there. Maybe at two, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. We'd never go home. <laughs> right. Because I'm always asking questions. Right. <laughs> and I know my colleagues always have questions. Right. And so um, that, that was difficult for me as well. Uh, yeah, it does seem broken and people are coming and yelling because people are hurt and they're angry. And even though we've had a change of three new commissioners on the, on the dais, um, people are still hurt. Like this election didn't change people's hurt. Right. It, didn't, it didn't stop them from seeing things that they have seen as um, um, no transparency and no truth coming from this leadership, right? And so one, it's, it's a matter of building trust. Now each one of us are responsible for our you know, individual wards. And for me, I, I'm trying to put myself in a position that I can, can hear from people, right? And, and people can get to know me because I, I don't want people putting me in a, a cookie cutter box and thinking that I'm the same as this person or that person because I'm very different and I've lived a lot of life in this community. And, and you can look at a person and just assume that this is who they are until you really know them, right? right? And so I, I welcome people to get to know who I am um, because I'm real, right? I have suffered and I have struggled and I've gone through things that most people would probably, you know, take a, a gasp at. Uh, in our community. Um, and, and I think, uh, again, to say this, that people need to be engaged 
um, but engage with your commissioner. So what I tried to do is um, when I started, and this is what I said from the beginning, is set up opportunities um, to, to connect with people, right? And so not, you know, those things don't happen for free. Right. So I try to check out what's going on in my community and find opportunities um, to do that. So I've been uh, setting up coffees. You know, it's it's an hour because I still work a job. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> I work a couple jobs, actually. So uh, set up times for people to come. Um, and just meet me and say hello and we can chit chat in the morning and then I've been doing a couple of after five times and I've been doing it at different businesses in the second ward so one people can see the business that's out there and patronize that business but also um, be able to meet with them and, and introduce and shake my hand and look me in my eye and then have that little bit more one-on-one -on -one versus absolutely. when it's at the commission meeting absolutely okay. Um, because we don't we don't get that up there now. I I typically when we've been done, I stay after a little bit. If there's you know people out there or people come up and say, hey, you know, I, I wanted to meet you or I've heard about you, and I had people show up. I think the last one I did was at the Meanwhile. Um, people that had you know heard my name or said I voted for you and I wanted to meet you. Absolutely. Guess what? I'm a real person. Right. And the meanwhile is great. Tammy always is always open. To Tammy is wonderful. Inviting. I, I love Absolutely. Tammy, and she has been a, a great support uh, for me. You know, when I started to run, I wanted to make sure to one be respectful and let um, the other commissioners uh, in the in the community know that I was going to do this, and then also for people who have been in the space to just listen to them and hear, you know, what they thought about the process and what they think about the work, and and then how I can be effective. Right. So I got a newsletter that goes out once a month that talks about all the things that are going on in the city and what I'm doing. Um, and that's another way for people to connect. To learn. Yep. To see right? what you're doing. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Here's another question. I was at the premiere of a new documentary about homelessness in Kent County, and it seems pretty, pretty hopeless. We need 35,000 new homes in the next five years. Evictions are on the rise due to inflation rates, interest rates, and making it harder for people to buy homes. What is the city doing to help these people? And this is from Jenny. Um, Jenny, hi, thank you. Um, that was something that I just talked about you did, yeah. uh, a few minutes ago. Um, and I think as we, part of it is as we go through this master plan process, um, is a good way to get that input from from community on how we can change things, right? It is daunting. A, a big lift like that, it is. And it's like, how are we going to do it? And so I think we have to begin to be creative. And when we talk about families, um, I, I have nine kids. Okay, wow. actually 11. Wow. I <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when you think about having a house, I, I couldn't have had all those kids in, a, in an apartment. No. I, now, I would have made it work, right. believe that, um, because I did, right? And But but um, getting my home when I did um, was really, you know, feeling safe, having been homeless before, um, having that space that's yours, um, it, it's, it's, it's different. Um, it does something for you, right? It and it brings you a sense of pride and a sense of hope that things can change. And when I see families that are sleeping in a car, but they work at the hospital, um, and they have nowhere to call home, uh, I, that pain sits with me. That's, that's a pain point for me. It and truly is. And then how is. can you be really good at your job when you're living in your, that stress of living in your car to be able to be efficient? It's bandwidth, and do it, yeah. right? and everybody's bandwidth is different. And then we expect things out of those people and we can't get that out of them right. because their bandwidth isn't enough. And they're stressed. It, and, and they're stressed, yeah. And so I think we, we as a city have to step back and we're gonna have to think about this a little different. We need to look at where we have space and land to build houses for families. But look at our city, guess what? In the, in, in the city, that's hard to find. And right. in the places where they're going, because this has a number of layers, because you have spaces that may be in neighborhoods, and then the neighborhoods don't want more housing being built there because it's taken away from things that they love, that, that make them feel comfortable, that give them peace. Right. And so now it's like, okay, well, where do we go? Right. 
right? Yeah. We don't want to take away all of our green space because we need that. We that, that helps the mental health of people yes. and the healing of people. So we don't want to take that away, but we have this space and we need a house, right? Yeah. So how can we do this and make it beneficial for everyone involved, the neighbors who are already there and the people who need a neighborhood? the people who need neighbors and people next to them and friends and their kids be able to build relationships with people in that space. But then when you have people in neighborhoods that don't want any more houses in their neighborhoods, then what do you do? Right. Yeah. It, it, you know, right. we all are going to have to give up some stuff yep. to help our community if we want it to be bigger and better and if we want people to thrive. And, to and be a community. To be a community. Yeah. Right? It yep. means, okay, you may not have 10 trees uh, along the side of your house because we might have to put another home there. And I know people are like, oh my God. But if I could build more in my backyard, guess what I would? Maybe that's something that's coming down the pike. I don't know. Right? Yeah. Right? You talk about grandmother apartments or mother in law apartments, yeah, studio and apartments like that. that yeah. Right. Okay, but that's still, that's, it's helping a single person, but, but it's not helping the family. family. Exactly. All right, um, really quick, we have just a couple more minutes. We'll, we'll do more questions after the break. Let's just do this question really quick. I see the planning, see the city planning to invest in the northeast side and in the particular Crescent neighborhood. I'm worried that this will just gentrify the neighborhood as the city has done with division and wealthy. What is the, the city doing to protect neighborhood identity and the history? And this is from George. Hi, George, uh, thank you for that question. And um, I have that same concern. Um, and have also heard from some constituents in that space um, that that is happening, right? And so now it's thinking about who owns the properties that are renting to people and how are they actually being equitable to the people that they've been re renting to, right? This person has been in this, this, this apartment renting for, you know, five years, eight years, 10 years, and now you see this development happening across the street, so you figure, ooh, this is a good time for me to raise my raise rent. Raise rent, yes. Is that, though? Right. Right? And, and who are you helping? So, it, you know, all of these questions are really complex because there's so many different levels to that. How do we address the property owners in helping them not to increase their costs that are gonna put a burden on the people that are already there that are low income or they may be getting section eight or they're on some type of voucher system that you know can't afford this and your rent is getting paid. Right, Right. yeah. So why would you increase that to put people in this position? And I don't, I don't, I don't know how to, I don't know how to address that. Now that is something that I will bring up and have been bringing up, right? But it also, it is happening, and it is happening. It you is happening. It, yeah, it is happening, and it needs to stop, right? But how do we stop that, right? What are what are the legal ramifications? What can we do? See, there's a lot of things that people think the city can do that the city can't Cannot do. do, right? Right. And we just assume, well, you, you're the people in power. You're the ones that are making the, the, the rules and the ordinances and all this stuff. You can do this. There's some things we can't do. Because, I mean, I came in guns blazing. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, yes, you can. You can change it. But there are some things that they can't do. Right. But there are things that they can do. And those are the things that we need to push to make sure that they do. Right. Um, it's really important that we're not putting up single uh, um, uh, dwelling units all over the city. We know we have a housing crisis, but a lot of these are market value, and it's not what the people in those neighborhoods can afford. And so we have to figure out a better way to do that, right? And there's, there's different uh, uh, voucher programs that these developers can get sometimes, Right. They can't get it all the time. And if they can get it, it helps with the cost of what these apartments might be. But, you know, my son um, is home from college and he's looking to move into his own space and he's moving forward with his career. And he's like, well, he wants to get, you know, I can move into this apartment. I don't want him to move into an apartment. I want him to be able to buy a home. But he can't buy a home right now with interest rates the way they are. No, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Right. And, and, and so. For him to be able to stay at home right now and, and build up his, his credit and save money to be able to do that it is something that I never thought I was going to be able to do, but I am able to do it for him. I want him to go, go out and, and be 
qualified and be ready to go into that space because it's a lot. But to, to go into a, um, a studio apartment paying $1,100 a month. Sometimes more. I'm, yeah. I'm not feeling that one. All right. Well, it's time for another break. Thanks for all your questions so far from Grand Rapids. We have one more segment for the show. So if you can have any more questions to ask, reach out to us by email at cityconnection at grcmc.org. Or again, you can leave a comment on our live stream on Facebook, YouTube, or The Rapidian. We'll be right back. How do you build a strong local food economy? Meet Chris. Chris is opening Osteria Rosa, a locally sourced Italian restaurant in a building brought back to life by 616 Development. But he doesn't know any local farmers to supply him with food year round. This is Melissa. Melissa runs the Fulton Street Farmers Market and publishes a long list, even in the dead of winter, of available produce, meats, bakery goods, and more on the Rapidian. This is Amy. Amy wants to do more to support the farmers in her local food economy. Amy talks to Melissa, who introduces her to farmers at the Fulton Street Farmers Market, and Amy, in turn, publishes their stories, also on the Rapidian. Chris hears about the Rapidian and now has access to a local grocery list and information that he needs to make connections with local farmers. He feeds his patrons with local food year-round. Connections multiply. Meals are shared a stronger local food economy is built. back to City Connection. My name is Starla McDermott, your host, and I am with Commissioner Knight today. All right, Commissioner Knight, we have some more questions for you. Yay. It says, when you were running for election, there was a lot of big donations from banks and CEOs for your opponent. Have you been approached by any of them now that you have won? And this is from Liam. No. No, that was an easy answer. Hi, Liam. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, you know, my campaign was really interesting. Um, because, you know, you, you have to have money. People don't understand. Because I used to say, would y'all stop asking me for money? I didn't it, get that when people were running for political positions, right? But to pay for the TV ads, to pay for the mailers, to pay for the stamps, to pay for the printing, to, you know what I mean? All of that stuff does cost money. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I struggled because people were struggling. And it was hard for me to ask the people that I knew that were struggling to give me to money, right? right? And so we, we made it work. I mean, we asked, um, we did, we put it out there and I appreciated every penny, every dollar, everything that was raised um, because you do have to cover costs of these things. Um, but no, I have not been approached or asked and nobody's given. And you know, even the things that I said in the last, last segment that I'm trying to do to make out to, uh, um, to reach out to community and, and try to provide opportunities for us to connect, you know, I've been trying to do that without there being any cost. Um, so one, I don't want it to be a cost for the constituents at all right. um, or to the businesses, right? Because I, I appreciate and respect small business because I do it. Um, I, I don't want to take from them, I want to help because people are still struggling mm -hmm. to keep their businesses going, right? And so this supports the business. Um, but you know, there's a lot of things that I would like to do. Um, so people can d donate. You can donate to me, and and all money is not good money, from what I've I've been told. So um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Second question: When Hartwell left office many years ago, he said racial equity was his most significant unfinished business. Nearly eight years later, we are still in the same place. 
I hear the city talk a lot about equity, but I don't see it happening. Are there any mean, meaningful steps the city is taking? And why should I stay here when I'll get offered fewer homes and pay more while getting offered fewer jobs and paid less to even do those jobs? This is from Janet. Janet, that was like a three-parter, I feel like. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna try my best. I can't speak to what uh, Mayor Hartwell said, uh, but um, I'll just say this, Martin Luther King has been working on <laughs> equity for a long time and, 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 and he's passed, right? And so here we are. Um, we got a lot of work to do in this community uh, across our country. And, and it seems like the fire is getting hotter and hotter um, every day uh, from anything that deals with your, your race, your gender, your ethnicity, um, your family makeup, all of those things. Uh, are, is the city doing work towards that? They've got a whole um, equity department that has been um, very strategic in trying to figure out how we go into communities and how we're working with communities and how we're pouring back into the community. So a lot of things have changed, um, but, but we are not there um, by any means. And I don't represent the whole city, <laughs> I, right? Um, so I can't change everything, right? Nobody has that magic wand uh, to make everything perfect. Uh, it's not gonna happen overnight. Um, and everything that happens requires everyone to be engaged in that change. So you can't just have uh, the city being the ones that are specifically supposed to be working on the equity issues in our community. Nope. Your businesses, yep. your schools, the nonprofits, your social service agencies, everybody needs to be working on it. And it can't be the buzzword or the thing for now. So we, we noticed when, um, when the riots happened and, and people were just really angry about all the things that were happening, not only in our communities, but across the nation, right? It was this big push, equity, equity, equity. That's all you heard. But I think it became a byword for people. And it felt really good to just use the word, but people like to use the word and say what they're doing, but they don't like to do stuff, right? And so I think that not only, it's, it's not just our, our city leadership, but it's our community as a whole that needs to be engaged in the things that are going on. And we need to stand up and have that allyship behind the words, right? So that means it might be uncomfortable for you to stand with this group because it's the right thing to do, but are you willing to do it, right? And I always like, love to point back to people because my, my father used to always say, you point your finger over here, but there's three, three more pointing more back up. at you, Absolutely. right? Yep. So I always have to look at myself and say, what, what am I doing, right? And, and I can throw that question back and say that. How does that impact us with businesses? Yep, they need to be at the table business leaders, CEOs, all of them need to be at the table having this conversation. But those conversations, when they get hot and fiery, people like to run, right? And how can we hold them accountable? What tools do we have to do that? A lot of times it's just the voice. But if you can get people at the table, you can begin to have those discussions. And if people are authentic, they'll stay at the table no and, matter how hard it gets. And come with an open heart in those conversations. Absolutely. Listen to, yeah, you need to come with an open heart and be willing to hear the hard stuff. It's got to be yeah. real change. That's going to make you uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. And it can't just be your statement that's on your website. Because if it's not happening internally. They don't see the work. That's it. See the work, yep. All right, another question. Have you heard about the child, child labor scandal at Hearthside Food Solutions? Is this looking, is there, are you looking into this or is the city looking into this? And this is from Tom. Tom, thank you. Um, I live here, so uh, yep, yeah, absolutely. A everybody has heard about it. Um, it's disgusting, it's, it's a horrible, um, it just, it, it hurts my heart. Um, but those things have been going on for a long time, right? And so is the city doing anything about it? I believe the city, um, um, city's legal team uh, is looking into it um, because they were trying to, I, th I think a part of it was trying to see if that was the Kent Kentwood branch or if it was Grand Rapids. It doesn't matter, it's still part of the larger organization. So there, um, there are some things that are going on um, to, to investigate and see what else is going on uh, across our community and I, I can't get too in depth in some of that because some stuff I don't even know. I don't know the steps, um, but there is some engagement. Investigation. Um, yes, that is happening with that. But you know, when we talk about um, this exploitation piece, 
right? Um, every question that has been asked to me today uh, has had so many layers to it, right? There's no yes answer um, to any one of these questions because again, this is gonna make us all step back and look at ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it's not just in our city, it's happening in different cities across this country, yep. but then also outside of our country, right? right? Because I've traveled a lot um, outside of the country and I've seen a lot and we become a part of the bigger problem, mm -hmm. but we don't want to address it because it's not right here. Right. Yep. At home. Yep. So um, anything that happens like that, I'm not in agreement with. It's ugly. We should never use our children like this. These children are suffering. These families, because they come from a family, they're all suffering. And we need to be um, a part of the solution in, in helping and speaking out when these things happen. And then also assisting and helping uh, these families. These families, yep. All right. Um, Quinn has a question. What is your favorite park in the second ward? <laughs> <laughs> Quinn, I, <laughs> I know who you are. <laughs> That was not fair. Um, my fa I love all of the parks. I love all of the parks in our community. I've done a lot of work with um, uh, the Friends of Grand Rapids Parks as well as our parks and recreation. I used to be a park leader uh, back in the day, so I love being at all the parks. I think maybe my favorite one is Riverside just because of how big it is and the bike trail and it's close to my home so I can ride my bike down and if I need to get in a quick ride, I can go from end to end and go home and feel like I really did and something. And you got some exercise. Um, but I, I love being in nature. I was raised like that. And so I enjoy it being immersed in all of them. But all of our parks across the city have something great to offer. Stop it, Quinn. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a couple more questions, but I think we're running out of time. Okay. If um, we had, if they have for these questions, they'd like to um, email you. Is there an email that they can reach out to you to yes. send these to? Um, they can reach out to L Knight at grand-rapids.mi.us. Okay. Uh, they can go to my website, which is friendsoflisanight.com, um, and send a message and or email through that. Um, and you can find me on social media. We have a page, Friends of Lisa Knight, on there. Uh, a lot of people in the community already know me. We probably are connected. So uh, reach out however you can. Okay. Um, I'll try my best to answer. Uh, I do have my me time, so I won't <laughs> answer during that. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> Got to have your boundaries. So yes, if you um, have any questions, do not hesitate to reach out to Commissioner Knight. Thank you for tuning in to City Connection. Thank you, Commissioner Knight, for Thank joining you. us today and answering our questions, and we hope to have you back soon. Absolutely. Don't forget to mark your calendars for our next episode on May 1st, where we'll delve into the important topics of affecting our city. Join us then. Thank you.